Welcome back, everybody. This is the fourth video in the introduction to advanced environmental science. And last time we were talking about natural capital and the goods and services that the environmental systems of the earth provide. And so this time I want to get into the topic of sustainability. Before we do that, we're going to connect them through the idea of resources. And probably some of you have already figured this out. The resources produced by the Earth's systems are regenerated at different rates. Some are made very slowly. Petroleum. Right? Modern oil was made 300 to 400 million years ago, and it took a long time for that to be turned into petroleum. It's the remains of dead forests, dead plants, dead plankton. On the other hand, fresh water is generated really quickly. Thus, we can think of all of our resources and their regeneration times and realize there's a continuum of regeneration times from very quick to very long. And therefore, we define resources in two ways. A renewable resource is a resource that may take a few days to regenerate, to maybe even up to a few hundred years, although that's getting pretty long, but maybe a decade or two. So that would be a renewable resource. In contrast, we have a non-renewable resource where it takes millennia or longer, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of years to regenerate a resource. Or maybe they're resources that cannot be regenerated. For example, helium. Helium is able to escape the Earth's gravity, leaves the Earth, can't be regenerated. So non-renewable resources, things like metals, metallic minerals, gold and tin, there's only a certain amount of it. There's only a certain amount of it that's e easily accessible in, in ores. And once we've used, if we use that up and squander it and disperse it around the globe, we're not going to get it back easily. Fossil fuels are the same way. Renewable resources are things like solar energy, soils, clean air, fresh water. And I actually wouldn't put biodiversity in a renewable resource. I would remove the biodiversity and say, hey, if we get rid of biodiversity, it's going to take 10 million years at least to regenerate it if we'd have a significant loss of biodiversity. And later on in the year, I'm going to try to prove that to you. And I would add ecosystems and natural commodities to the renewable box. So sustainability then when we talk about that, the first thing we have to think about is in the long run, meaning at some point in the future, human society and human economy will have to live within the constraints and limitations imposed by global systems. I, I, does that make sense to you? So when human society does not degrade natural capital, we can say that we have a sustainable society. And we can look at those rates of regeneration of a resource to further our understanding of sustainability. We must live off income, not off savings. That embodies the idea of sustainability. The income being the annual productivity of a forest, the savings being the entire forest. If we cut down the whole forest at once, we'll have to wait a long time to get anything out of it. Another way to say this is we can use a resource at no more than the rate at which it is regenerated. And if we do use a resource at more than that rate, then we have to see if it's recyclable. In the case of wood, it's not really recyclable. When wood gets old, the only thing you can do then is, is burn it, put it back into carbon dioxide, and hope a plant captures it and makes more wood. With something like gold or silver or metals or ores, we can recycle them. Another way to think about sustainability is to realize that it seems that current human society is living off savings. How do we know that? We know that because we know that we're using oil at a rate at which it will all be gone within 50 to 1,000 years, if you believe the various estimates. Almost all the copper on Earth, usable copper, has been mined at this point. If we're using the accumulated stock of minerals, oil, animal and plant populations, ecosystems, if we're using them up, that is not sustainable. If we we're taking some of their annual productivity, that would be sustainable. A lot of people who have thought about this say 
because we are degrading and reducing resources and ecosystem service, current society is borrowing from the ability of future generations to support themselves. Borrowing from the future. Thus, the importance of sustainability is the ethical question to be asked of each of you. Do you agree that humans must start to live sustainably? Or do you think, as many people do, that future generations will figure out how to cope with decreased resource availability? They'll figure it out. We're going to live the way we want to live now, and they'll figure it out. That's something for you to think about, where you fall on that continuum and what you need to do to, to live your beliefs. I wanted to look now at the way various groups have tried to define sustainability. Lester Brown of the World Watch Institute said, a sustainable society is one that is able to satisfy its needs without diminishing the chance of future generations. And that echoes a bunch of the sentiments that we saw on the last slide. And on the last slide, we were defining sustainability by the rates of resource regeneration. Contrast that with this definition that I pulled off the web from someone, can't quite remember who. A sustainable society is one that ensures the health and vitality of human life and culture and of nature's capital for present and future generations. Such a society acts to stop the activities that serve to destroy human life and culture in nature's capital and to encourage those activities that serve to conserve what exists, restore what has been damaged, and prevent future harm. So there are two things I can see in this definition. What do you see? Take a moment to think about it. Maybe stop the video and think about what's new about this definition. Well, this definition, to me, does two things. First of all, it doesn't only include the Earth's systems, but it includes human life and culture, as well as natural capital, in a sustainability definition. So that's interesting. And the second thing is that it says that we need to conserve, we need to restore, and we need to prevent future harm. These mean big changes in the way we do things as society and the way we are probably as individuals. Conserve what exists, restore what has been damaged, prevent future harm. Because right now, we're not conserving that much. We're not doing a lot of restoration except locally in a few places. And we're certainly not preventing future harm. We're really leaving it to future generations to figure out how to live sustainably. Next, the United Nations has the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. And in that agenda, which was put forth, I believe, in 2015, they identified 17 goals. And take a look at these goals. And I only put down the goals. You know, there's a huge amount of verbiage associated with this giant summary and then an even bigger report. But I want you to look at it. The first one, no poverty. Second one, zero hunger. I would say those could have been combined into one goal, but... Let's not pick nits, because if you have no poverty, you're not going to have hunger, probably. People would be able to afford food, and we all know that the earth produces plenty of food. The reason people are hungry is because they don't have the money to buy food. Good health and well-being for people. Quality education for people. Gender equality for people. Clean water and sanitation for people. Affordable and clean energy for people. Decent work and economic growth for people. Industry, innovation, and infrastructure for and by people. Reduced inequality of people. Sustainable cities and communities that contain people. Responsible consumption and production by people. Climate action taken by people. And then finally in goal 14, life below water. The goal 15, life on land. I think this is the first time we see things that aren't related to people here. Goal 16, peace and justice, strong institutions. That's loaded. Must have a lot of, of content behind it. And partnership to achieve goals, which means everybody on earth is responsible for engaging actively with each other to achieve these goals. So the UN 
really expands the human part of this, reduces the natural systems part to a teeny bit, and includes some, some other things in it that would require a lot of time uh, to understand, I think. I point that out just because there's been a tension in the environmental movement between people who looked out only for other species and only for the environment and people who look out only for people. These represent the integration of those two ideas. People who have thought about the issue of sustainability have come to the conclusion that a sustainable society must not only make environmentally sound decisions, but also ensure that all people have equal opportunity. In other words, as the title of this slide says, sustainability requires more than looking after the Earth's systems. I want you to think about that for a second and think about whether you agree with that and if so, what that means. And I would also say that this theme will be developed in the course. But I'd ask you right now as system thinkers, as people are starting to understand what it means to think systemically, can you see why this would be true? Why we can't just have environmental sustainability if we don't have things such as equity, education, and opportunity for all people. I want to go back and revisit Lester Young's definition of sustainability because that's associated with the sentiment that, that left people out and revise it to sustainability is the ability to meet current human need for natural resources without compromising the needs of future generations and without compromising the needs of people in other countries or in other places. In other words, if we just add that, we now have a succinct definition of sustainability that includes people in a deeper way. Here is a graphic about sustainable development that it includes environmentally sound decisions, socially equitable decisions, and economically viable decisions. And I think the economically viable is important as well, although I'm not going to spend much time discussing that right now, but we will come back to those ideas at a later date. I now want to introduce another environmentalist. His name is David Orr. He is an environmental thinker and a professor at Oberlin first, and he's now at the University of Vermont. He sort of looked at environmental problems and said, hey, you know, there's technological sustainability and there's also ecological sustainability. And they're different, and we really need to be clear about these differences and think more about them. So here's what they are. Technological sustainability, TS as I've abbreviated here, is that the modern way of doing business is fine. We just need to invent some new, more environmentally friendly technologies and price things at their real cost. And we will just build sustainability into the, into the way we do things now. And he said, ecological sustainability in contrast, ES as I've abbreviated here, we must invent a new revolutionary, I would add, postmodern world that transcends, and this is quite a list, so you may want to pause the video afterwards and think about it, individualism, thinking about the individual as the ultimate aspect of human society, anthropocentrism, humans are the center of the earth, patriarchy, control of human society by men, mechanization, that the best way to deal with the earth is to employ machines to do jobs for us, economism, the idea that economic values are the best or only values, consumerism, the idea that our purpose is to consume things, nationalism, that our nation state is actually important, and militarism, that we resolve problems through military might, at least at times. We have to transcend all of these things. Whoa, that's a tall order. That's really big thinking, really tough to understand. But that's the goal, according to Orr. He sees the second as essential for the long-term survival of humans. He believes humans will drive themselves to extinction without it. And he sees the first type of sustainability as a necessary first step. So first, we have to rein in what we're doing with technological sustainability, adjusting the system, and then we have to figure out how to evolve a new worldview. You can be sure 
that systems thinking will be a part of that evolution. Otherwise, Orr says, humans will not be around. Another way to say this is that technological sustainability is necessary to stabilize the planet's vital signs, and ecological sustainability is necessary to save the patient and avoid the problems that got us in trouble in the first place. Orr points out that the practitioners of these two ways of thinking tend to have very different views about how bad our current situation is, um, as well as many other philosophical differences about the organization of democracy and power. And so there are some real fundamental differences in the way advocates of technological sustainability view the world and advocates of ecological sustainability view the world. What do you think about that? Is ecological sustainability just too big for your brain right now? Does it hurt? That's okay if it is, but I would want you to think about that in the long run. Most environmental studies textbooks really only present technological sustainability. And, and one of the things I like to do in this course is constantly be pushing you to think about there's more. There's more to be had. All we have to do is look at history to see how different things are over time in, the way, in terms of the way people think about the world. Here's one view of how technological sustainability may be achieved. Stabilize human, human population. Prevent pollution where possible. Restore degraded, degraded environments. Use resources of, uh, efficiently. Protect natural ecosystems. Educate all boys and girls. It probably should be educate all girls and boys since the real issue is with girls. Prevent and reduce waste. Eradicate hunger and poverty. You notice that our textbook has nothing about changing the fundamental way that humans view nature, changing the fundamental way our economy is organized to exploit nature. It's just all these technological solutions, technological sustainability, or would not be impressed with our textbook. So that's it for lecture four. Next time, we're going to talk about consumption and think about how we as individuals consume and what our effect is on the planet. Until that time, study hard.